All right, all right. So recently, so for those who are watching on YouTube, recently Richard Wolf and Destiny had a debate. Richard Wolf is a pretty famous uh, Marxist economist, and uh, Destiny is a big old debate bro. So yeah, there's two different spheres of politics and two different spheres of interaction coming together in a colliding moment. Uh, basically, they had a discussion, and the internet went crazy for a while about it. So as a whole, let's go see how this went, basically. Okay, here we go. Hey, in the three minutes I have, I cannot speak as fast as you just did, so I won't even try. I'll try to make a couple of basic points. Every economic system in the history of the world displays the following pattern. It is born, it evolves over time, and then it dies and passes away, giving way. So we can generally agree that's kind of just a general trend, I think. I don't think there's anything controversial about that. A ...to another one. And part of that process has always been the conviction of the people in each economic system that sooner or later God, they and I can, hate seeing the, they should this, like the speed and, the speed to which uh, different chats come in sometimes just physically bother my eyes because you have like it's right there and you can't help but focus on it and then it just yeah very nice that's my brain they will do better overcome some of the problems and difficulties they're facing and organize a system that better meets human needs. The process is sometimes relatively smooth, other times it's rocky. That varies with the conditions and particularly with the level of resistance from those who don't want to see the system change and shift. Capitalism, in my judgment, has been born, most would agree, Okay. has evolved over the last three centuries or so and is now well sometimes the problem that can come with clarifying here is that specifically the transition between different uh, policies is different like historical economic systems this can be a little difficult because what happens is we have like a series of markers that fuel like uh, economic uh, institutions economic principles or economic uh, designs that basically feed into the eventual formation of what we define as capitalism like people uh well we can agree on a general timeline of how things develop the issue that comes with marking the transitions between different economic and political systems is that sometimes it can be difficult like uh, uh basically feudalist uh, economic systems and then transitioning into like more uh, into the capitalist uh, economic system we have a lot of uh, different markers you know a uh, general historical trend is uh, the transition from the Roman Empire and its collapse and then transitioning into smaller scale uh, political entities uh, we have the Byzantines we have the Holy Roman Empire we have uh, we also have like a sig there's a significant differences in how things form, how things decay, and they, how things uh, progress. So like, uh, for example, uh, Chinese history versus like uh, Western European history or like Italian or like Roman history is they're all very different. We can agree there's a general trend. It's just hard to mark the differences that occur there for like a uh, econ for in terms of economic series because feudalism doesn't automatically just come into existence after the Roman Empire. It's more like feudalism uh, slowly develops over time into these uh, institutions and mechanisms we have, like the the fiefdoms, uh, the castles, and all these different ways, because feudalism forms out of uh, a need, in a way, and it fills in a uh, space over time that uh, had... It fills in a, t a space over time that the Roman Empire significantly left in terms of like uh western feudalism now you can make a make a question of like is there a comparison for like chinese chinese history and if there's significant markers of feudalism now 
I think Western uh, historians are going to generally like include them under um, feudalist feudalism as a whole. It's just the ways they manifest and the ways they interact in the society are pretty different. Sorry, that was a little complicated there. Now at that last stage, the only question now is exactly how and when the passing occurs. Likewise, in my judgment, the yearning for something better has built up in capitalism to a pretty intense level now. Whether you look at the debts of students, whether you look at the mind-bending inequality that this system generates over and over again, unless and until it is revolted against by masses of people who do something about the inequality only to discover that as long as capitalism remains, the tendency to inequality resumes. I think people are also tired of so the let's, instability. Let's, let's zoom that back a little bit. Up in capitalism okay. and is now at that last stage. The only question now is exactly how and when the passing occurs. Sure. Yeah. Likewise, in my judgment, the yearning for something better has built up in capitalism to a pretty intense level now. Whether you look at the debts of students, whether you look at the mind-bending inequality that this system mm -hmm. generates over and over again, unless... So, yeah, so basically um, there are significant markers here for uh, the failures of in the quote-unquote capitalism itself, right? Um, so basically is uh, there, there's a, there's a, it's not a clear process for defining uh, the failures in this instance, but a significant instance, I think we can agree of how like when capitalism gets into this late stage of failure is that we have significant development of fascist and socialist ideologies so um what happens is as capitalism basically makes people's lives worse like significantly worse then we have the development of more radical ideologies so fascism and socialism i you know being communist think socialism pretty good Com and then fascism bad so like that's the agree so what happens is it's kind of like a in a way, an abusive mother, which is capitalism, capitalism, and then it forms the uh, children, right? They form these uh, more extreme uh, policies in order to resolve the overall inequalities that exist in society. Give me a second. There we go. Okay. So basically, that's the process that occurs. Now, you could theoretically reform capitalism, sure. But the problem significantly comes is like, one, in my view, it maintains the fundamental mechanisms, the institutions that allow for this inequality to occur and allow this inequality to uh, continue to exist. Basically... Capitalism maintains power, maintains inequality, and fundamentally harms a significantly more significant greater population of people compared to the amount of people that it's going to assist. Like we, uh, the amount of like uh, concentration of wealth and the concentration of uh, power is significantly coming into fruition. Now you have to ask the question: Is um, how do we mark? How do we uh, determine which nations are uh, suffering under a greater level of uh, greater level of failure of capitalism? Well, it's not a perfect metric, but basically, is you have to gauge where there is the development of more radical ideologies as a byproduct, and then we have to determine uh, the concentration of wealth. We have to determine the overall average living conditions uh and like a median mode i mean and we have to look at all those different factors in order to be able to make an effective determination 
So basically, we have to look at all of those things and see if there's any, see if there's a either a progression or a general decay. So while there, now the issue that can also come is like, okay, wow. Well, so if we have, um, if we have, uh, if it. If we have the failures of capitalism, why do we have like a general improvement in quality of life over time? And then why uh, do we have uh, greater health care? And so that's the problem that comes in itself is it's not a perfect standard, but it's also basically that even though that is in my view is even though we have an improving quality of life, we have an improvement in uh, health care itself. It's, you can see in the, uh, the amount that people have to work. So for example, uh, significantly more people are working like more than 40 hours a week, uh, more than eight hours a day. Uh, the inflation rates for pay versus like, um, versus like, uh, productivity, right? We have an increase in productivity, but we don't have a match for actual, like, a uh, brain, what's it called? We don't have a matching rate for the value produced, like how much money is generated and all that stuff versus like how much people are being paid because since the 1970s, it's been a significant decline. So that's an example. And it's also sometimes the issue is people look at it as an immediate set, like, okay, is it immediately failing? What we've seen is a general timeline since like the 40s even or the 20s problem like basically that portion of history up to now right it's been a significant decline a significant decline in terms of people's overall level of effect on their own life level of democracy like a level of uh, choice and level of independence because as increasingly more power isn't concentrated into fewer hands and that also relates to like wealth. So that's the problem in itself. Even if we do have an increase in quality of life, increase the standard of living, the amount of autonomy and power that people hold is decreasing itself. And so those are all kind of like, it's kind of like a weird relationship and you have improve, you have increases, but you also have significant measures of decreases. So it's kind of a weird relationship going on there. And until it is revolted against by masses of people who do something about the inequality only to discover that as long as capitalism remains, the tendency to inequality resumes. Yes. I think people are also tired of the instability. Every four to seven years, capitalism crashes. We've had three in this new century in its 20 years. Yep right on schedule mm -hmm. every four to seven years. Millions lose their jobs. Businesses go belly up. Yeah. And and significantly, the people who are going to suffer the most to are going the to be uh, on. workers, citizens, One sign of the, the average exhaustion person. exhaustion of this system, a level of money creation, a level of debt creation, we have never God, seen I hate this chat. government debt, corporate debt, Not gonna personal lie. debt. The system is... It's checking out Destiny subreddit and his chat. Um... Kind of brain dead. Just saying. Exhausted. And the entire private enterprise system Give me a second. is now. There we go. on 24-7 government life support. I think it's over. I think that's difficult for us all to live through. And we better learn some lessons from the British Empire from which they have been tumbling for a century. We could and should do better on the downswing than the British have been able to. And the more we talk about it and discuss it and explore it, the better our chances to make another progressive transition to a better system that we all need and will benefit from. Yep. Okay, Destiny? I generally agree Oof, with that argument. Are you going to on a timer? Itself. I am. 
All right. As of March 2021, Americans rank the economy, job markets, the handling of the coronavirus, and leadership in Washington as the four most important challenges facing our country. Socialist policies would not alleviate any of these concerns. Countries have tried the socialist experiment. Time and time again, this has failed. Doctors in Cuba moonlight as taxi drivers. Countries with socialized health care haven't fared much better than the U.S. in their handling of the coronavirus. And any socialist re regime will necessarily involve the bureaucracy of Washington even more heavily in our economy. Any country that has attempted to realize a fully socialist economy has either failed completely, such as in the case of the USSR, destroyed large swaths of their economy, such as in Venezuela, or been forced to embrace more neoliberal economic policies to realize true growth in their economy, such as in China or Vietnam. Liberal market policies work better in both theory and practice when it comes to efficiently allocating resources to maximizing the economic productivity of any country, and we've seen this play out time and time again across a wide variety of markets and countries throughout history across the globe. Oftentimes, people like Richard Wolff will bring up the boom-bust cycle as though it's an inherent flaw of capitalism, but I believe I speak for most when I say that a boom-bust cycle is preferable to just going bust, as so many socialist countries have. It's also All right. He's saying a lot of words very quickly okay let's break this down a little bit right so we have to ask him how does he characterize socialism does his characterization properly match definitions of socialism and it also have to ask is that is his characterization of quote-unquote liberal uh market policies actually reflective of reality so for the first counteraction that you can make here is that one, uh, well, while we may be increase producing incredibly, we are wasting heavily. So for example, like uh, we throw out like uh, companies throw out so much food and waste every single year, and. Let's let's go back. Let's just wind that back around a little bit because he said a lot of words and I'm trying to like break it down in my head and there's a lot to break down. Just in the case of the USSR, destroyed and attempted to okay. a fully social. All right, so USSR and Cuba, right? So what happens when we characterize USSR and Cuba as socialist, right? So. What are the main markers in this instance of socialism? One, worker-owned means of production. So basically, the workers control factories, control spaces, like, for example, Twitch. While the infrastructure, while the each individual is going to have access to technology, like computers and uh, webcams like I have here, they're fundamentally not going to have uh, control of the means of production in terms of the infrastructure, right? So like YouTube, Twitch, uh, all these different streaming platforms and recording platforms. I don't own that as a worker in this instance, right? But Twitch, the Twitch company, the people who own Twitch own that means of production. So that's one, that's an example of how socialism should be defined. Now, another, ba that's basically one of the underlying factors itself, right? And then also is... A lot of people like to characterize uh, state control in this instance as a means of, and it's also socialism. Typic basically is inclu including uh, democratic, uh, more democracy. So in this instance, and in our current system is we have a representative democracy, and then from there it basically comes to a greater liber uh, liberalization, right? where an effective means is through having workers more involved in the democratic process, and this way they can more effectively reform the system to uh, counteract that. And then another measure I would say is how to put, uh, cover the basic life expenses. So, sorry, like cover like basic life expenses, uh, food, water, uh, electricity, shelter, and even to some extent technology. So those are all significant markers of, like, I think, in a way, how on a pure economic level, socialism should be formed, right? Uh, Worker-owned means of production, uh, decommodification of basic life expenses, and increased level of democratic participation. Uh, less through um, representation and more through 
direct democratic processes and a bit of D and those are like the main components. However, there's a lot of uh, processes that go on. A lot of people have interpreted it and choose to implement in different ways. So there's, there's also the, the reality that uh, socialism as a concept, socialism as a policy is constantly like evolving while I think in a way still maintaining these fundamental principles of worker owned uh, decommodification of life expenses and increased democratic participation. So from there, those are the main principles, I would say. Then the question you have to ask here is, this is where a lot of uh, traditions break down and uh, go into different ideas and how to implement. So the USSR originally had the intent of implementing these policies, right? Lenin himself, he said, okay, we're going to have the workers own the means of production, blah, 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 blah. But the problem comes is with the USSR history itself is that while it, oh yeah, so there's another qualifier. So historically, socialist, uh, socialist policy engage in a revolution in order to implement these policies as a whole. While not everybody advocates for revolution, it's, Oh, right, right, right. So revolution is a means to putting into place a policy. It is not a policy itself. So that instance, there are people who are going to make distinctions amongst a uh, revolution versus like a reform. So in this instance, the USSR engaged in a revolution. They uh, broke down the traditional monarchy and instit instituted a new authority. This So they broke down one state, the monarch state, and implemented a Soviet state. Now you have to ask the question is, does this Soviet state accurately reflect socialist policies? Well, first off, uh, first off, the worker did not own the means of production, right? What happens is power was concentrated into the hands of a center of a single party, that single party itself, uh, dictated what people would produce, dictated, uh, dic it basically dictated all the different process that workers themselves would work and produce, and it was a central planning issue, or a central planning method. Now, the issue that comes with that is that central planning relegates authority and power into the, the single party itself instead of relegating power into the workers themselves. Now, the issue that also comes is... Life ex basic life expenses were not decommodified. What happens is, while while originally it may have some level of decommodification, as who so as a USSR shows, it transitioned into a capitalist economy. So the problem comes is that it never truly implemented socialist policies. And it also didn't increase democratic participation. What we had was a centralization of authority through originally Stalin, or it was first like Lenin. He was significant, like even from the get-go, the amount of democratic participation was significantly restricted. And that made it significantly more difficult for any types of truly uh, effective socialist policies. While they may have socialist elements, it does not mean it was socialist. So it's like socialistic, but not socialist. And so that's the main distinction you have to make here is when you cl classify uh, things like the USSR, it may have had an initial socialist revolution. It didn't have a, um, it didn't have a socialist government. It did not have a socialist organization. It, the workers did not own needs production. They also were paid wages. So, so basically is they were paid wages for their work. Like uh, you can look it up. It basically, the central the central party paid them a wage based on their work through quotas and all that stuff, and from there, the that means it came back to a means of exploitation, a means of capitalism. So his point that the USSR did not uh, relied on capitalist uh, methods in order to have uh, growth and all that stuff is true. Destiny does make this point correct. However, the category the characterization of the USSR as a socialist state is a problem because what happens is we have markers of what socialism is 
But when people rely on the rhetoric of socialism, right? Stalin, v uh, Lenin, and future pre uh, future descendants and leaders heavily relied on that the the rhetoric of socialism, the rhetoric of socialism, like uh, the aesthetic, right? The aesthetic itself is of decommodification, uh, revolution, and then worker-owned mean means of production. In reality, authority and control was placed into the central party. So what happens is, then from there, we can say it had the aesthetic and rhetoric of socialism. It did not have the implementation of so socialism. And so you have to make that distinction itself. So there's also the issue that can come with like Cuba, right? A initial socialist revolution. But the problem comes is Fidel Castro held power from the beginning. He was in charge. He made himself in charge for life. There is never a transfer of power or even a decentralization of power that would make it act effective for the workers to effectively participate and democratically control itself. And he also there's wages and all that stuff that different exists. And it's a lot of how the mechanisms of the institutions form and where the power and authority is placed. Because I, as an anarchist, view the state as a fundamental uh, antagonist to socialist policies. So, uh, socialism as a whole does not work with the control of the state. The state is the fundam is a fundamental mechanism of power. It's a systemic means of power and control. So that systemic means of power and control continues to function regardless of individuals from there after it's formed. It continues to function on its own. And then from there, it effectively puts people into power, has them control and dictate the choices people make and dictates policy and it takes what's going to occur. So that's all the fundamental problems that come into these things themselves. So it's all very complicated and you can ask, okay, um, why? So from there, does it also include like, uh, there's also the fact like, and from the onset, they didn't even engage in socialist policies, but it also, you know, like these the countries following the aesthetic also face significant, um, what's it called? Uh, pressures, right? Uh, they face significant economic pressures from different nations that would put problems into their own dealings, and it made it significantly more difficult to deal with all this stuff. So, yeah. Th safe. So, in the whole ramblings, the USSR, Cuba were never effectively socialist. They may have engaged in a revolution on the aesthetic of socialism, but the, the results itself say that the power was never concentrated into the workers and the state itself, the state or the person and the person in charge concentrated power into their own hands and it prevent, fundamentally effectively prevented control by the workers. This economy has either failed completely, such as in the case of the USSR, illiberal Rural market policies work better in both theory and practice when it comes to efficiently allocating resources to maximizing the economic productivity of any country, and we've seen this play out time and time again across a wide variety of markets and countries throughout history across the globe. Oftentimes, people like Richard Wolff will bring up the boom-bust cycle as though it's an inherent flaw of capitalism, but I believe I speak for most when I say that a boom-bust cycle is preferable to just going bust as so many socialist countries have. So... That is a rhetoric, right? Basically, these quote-unquote socialist nations have failed, and therefore, these socialist nations have failed, and therefore, they are a preference to capitalist nations in this instance. Sure, but the problem is they were never effectively socialist, and therefore, you can't, can't make a proper comparison between socialist nations and uh, China. Uh, capitalist nations in that instance. It's also important for us to realize that no economic organization is in and of itself inherently moral or immoral, but rather we ought to view them as tools to effect some greater output for our country that we can later utilize and distribute in the most fair manner with government policy to most of our citizens as we see fit, creating a bigger, a bigger pie, so to speak, from which all of us can eat. Morality and justice should exist in the realm of government policy. We cannot allow it to blind us to the economic realities surrounding us. No matter how much we wish a wild lion not to eat us, our desire alone will never satiate its appetite. 
While socialism may sound good in theory, the destruction it would wrought on the wealth of our country and the oppressive restrictions it would place on. All right. That's still the continuing rhetoric of how USSR and all that stuff were socialist, and therefore it's an accurate representation of socialism itself. So that's a problem. On our businesses would not help the vast majority of Americans. It would be foolish to enforce protectionist or socialist policies on our economy while major developing economies, such as India and China, are moving in the exact opposite direction, having realized time and time again the failures in socialist planning. Socialism implies two major things, a change in both the means and mode of production. The means of production change in such a way to completely disallow private investment or ownership, and a change in the mode of production such that we no longer produce goods and services for a profit. Instead, businesses are only started with the approval of some governmental body, some kind of central planning, when the equal decision-making and management of every worker and the goods and services produced in any society are what some government body dictates, irrespective of market forces or the wants and desires of the So, he is correct. So basically, is he's saying that these nations themselves, while he's categorizing them as socialists again, he is correct in his critiques of these nations because central dictation, it, outside of market forces, all that stuff. So it's a so his categoriz his uh, characterization of these nations and how they are implemented and how they are effective, uh, how they function are is pretty on point. However, the problem that comes is his labeling of socialist. That's the issue the citizens. It's likely in the course of this debate that my opponent will suggest we take after Nordic or Western European countries, setting that things like socialized health care or subsidized education are powerful programs that address many of the underserved needs of Americans today. While this is true, I would like to remind everyone that we've spent the God, last decade reminding chat. conservatives that the government They're simply just providing welfare has want to suck his dick so much. <laughs> with socialism. My opponent believes that strong social safety nets and welfare programs are important parts of the government. Most liberals who welcome him with open arms, me included. Consequentially, there are five major hurdles that no socialist... I Mm, okay well okay so the problem comes is that he's he's kind of a uh, putting a blanket statement on liberal policy while significant liberals do support um different social safety nets and welfare policies it's not a guarantee that they're going to support it and it's not a guarantee that it's going to be implemented so there's a lot of problems that come into it into the liberal policies themselves because the liberal policies, while may be able to alleviate the conditions themselves, the conditions either backslide or they don't address the, the actual realities that uh, work people who deal, people who live deal with them. So basically, there's a lot of uh, barriers that come into implementing these policies. And social safety nets and social welfare itself, while there are historical markers that occurred before... Uh, no, 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 wait. So what happens is uh, we had things, we had like a socialism, uh, socialist theories that come into formation, right? We had Marx, we had uh, Engels, we had all the different people who abdicated. And one example is of uh, social safety nets, right? And these implementing of these uh, different ideas and how to uh, address the material conditions or the material conditions like living sta uh, circumstances and all the realities that people have to deal with. But the problem comes is that then capitalist nations adopted these policies. Some of them did, not all of them. And some have adopted, and from there, the implementation of those policies have significantly uh, degraded or they've been pushed back. And the extent that they've been impl impl implemented is uh, not effectively representing... Re re I can't talk today not effectively representing how much the needs of people, right? We had the uh, social democracies in like Swiss and Switzerland and all that stuff. And what happens is we've seen a degrade in them. We've had a significant, significant uh, reduction in the amount these policies are implemented and the extent that they uh, address the needs of the people who live in those countries. We've had things like Obamacare that came into existence in the United States. And from there, while it was implemented, it had significant barriers that was done by both liberals and conservatives that made it more difficult to be implemented and more effectively allowed to address the living conditions of people like healthcare and all that such. So the problem comes is he's adopting these things as liberal while they these ideas were originally started by socialists. And they have been like co-opted by capitalists and liberals in the arguments themselves because they recognize that an extent that the workers a better a happier worker a better life for a worker 
is better than original. But the problem comes is they don't guarantee that a worker has a better life and a better circumstance. And so those are all different Prob so it also comes down to is like, sure, you can implement the policies, but the mechanism of the institution, right? The mechanisms of capitalism, the mechanisms of the state, as I understand it, as I view it, fundamentally retain the ability to counteract this, draw away from this, because a lot of uh, social welfare policies are going to degrade, decline over the course of generation when they're implemented, because we have more conservative voices, we have more right-wing voices. And then from there, the liberals, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a constant battle of forces. Like, even if we do implement them and Im implement these more social welfare policies, they are going to increase, but they can be cut back. They can also not guarantee that they're going to be implemented in the first place. There's a lot of different barriers that fundamentally come into fruition when these institutions exist. So there's a lot of problems in that as a whole ever spoken to is adequately addressed and they are as follows number one what level of violence is acceptable for you to reach our socialist state number two how do we decide which businesses are allowed to exist in a socialist society without allowing private capital investment three is any form of investment whatsoever allowed in a socialist society for an expansion so another problem is he's saying that investment is a fundamental component like uh, capital investment is a fundamental component of how economies work and what he's doing is he's trying to force Wolf into working within the framework of capitalism itself, right? He's saying this is the policy we have, this is how it should be for all economic systems, and that's a problem in itself. ...of business. Four, how are labor markets determined in a socialist society? And five, how do we calculate which goods and services a nation needs if we do away with the commodity form? Those are my five. Cool. All right, so we're going to do the open format now for the next hour. Um, I don't think I'm going to need to moderate too much as long as both of you just say something and allow the other person to speak and don't talk over each other. It should be fine. So uh, I guess begin uh, now. All right. Destiny does this so much. He, he throws a lot of ideas at you all at once and you're having to like break it down and then you start like you cover down like the the fifth a fifth of all the fifth uh, fifth of all five things he brings up right and then you're like okay he talks about the fifth and he brings up the sixth one and he just keeps going and it's just like okay it's exhausting and he speaks quickly he engages a lot of rhetoric that makes it difficult because you know the, the rhetoric of this is a socialist nation because they've labeled themselves a socialist and it's like, okay, well, just because they label themselves as socialists doesn't mean they've actually implemented socialism. There's a lot of things that go on, and it's it's a lot, I'll tell you that. My brain has to, like, listen and, like, interpret, like, 30 seconds of information, then he's going on to the next 30 seconds of information. Where do you want to start? Well, let, can, let I, can I respond to what was said? Yeah, whatever yeah, you course. want to say, yeah. Okay. Um, I find this a laughable caricature of anything I've ever written or anything that I understand uh, is part of this conversation. And I don't appreciate being told what I think or what I say or what I mean or what I intend. I can speak for myself and that would just be fine if we could allow each other to do that, number one. Number two, I have no idea what this uh, silly remark that I hear so often is that no socialist society has all right well seems like uh richard wolf does the marxist leninist talking points <laughs> well that's fun um do i want to listen to all this not really so let's for them what socialism means is the transformation of the everyday life of working people what the Chinese were doing, namely, develop their... All right. So, yeah, uh, Marxism, Leninism. It's not socialism. It's not. It's just in a... It's taking on the aesthetic of socialism and through and basically wants to uh, concentrate power into an authority. And, you know, authoritarian regimes are directly contradictory to socialist policies. So, pretty bad. I don't really want to engage with that because it's not really worth it because Marxist Leninists are honestly pretty cringe and Richard Wolff, while he himself may be pretty well-renowned, I think him them talking that it's 
Marx is uh, talking that USSR, China are socialist nations. It's pretty bad. So, yeah. Their country so that foreign private investment would come. China didn't get any foreign aid because they were communists and the United States. They called themselves communists doesn't mean they were communist. And it's also that China was an antagonist to the United States and the United States was antagonist to them. They were enemies and the United States also significantly dominated uh, infrastructures of like the global community where, you know, like the IMF and all the different nations, they dictated the policy, they dictated uh, interactions by different nations. So it doesn't make any sense to what, like, it isn't just because they called themselves communists. That is the common, like, appeal of aesthetic, right? But that's not the reality there. So that's, it's pretty dumb to say that they did it just because they called themselves communists. It's because China as a whole was an antagonist to uh, the interests of the United States on a international level. So that's a lot of things in itself. Didn't give them any. But they did a better job than all the countries who did get it in order to get to the point of economic development where it became interesting for capitalists in Germany. Okay. Every day That's not what a worker co-op's maximizing for, though. A worker co-op, if by your definition, which is a democratically voted uh, organization, is going to be trying to take into account what their members are voting for. They might not vote in the best interest of a shareholder. They might vote to do something no, completely that, different that with the company. That would be understood by the shareholder. So, I've, I've gone over this a little bit before. So, what they were discussing here is if a worker co-op, uh, why people would invest in a worker co-op if they have no legal obligation to pay back their, um, pay back the stock itself, right? But then, but that's my entire point. By the way, point. Only, only the most naive shareholder in the United States believes that the company's decisions are intended to do the best for the shareholder. I can show you 50,000 legal cases in which that's not the case and which it, it is contested in the courts and you could have that in a in a worker That's co -op great and I can show you the too. and I can show you the Dow Jones, the Nasdaq and the S&P 500. We could go to the UK and look at the FTSE 250, the FTSE 1 and I can show you histories of markets where companies do reliably over long periods of time return profits whether in the form of dividends or the increase in your share price to people that invest in those companies. I'm sure you can show me a lot of things that happen. But, but wait, wait, wait. Okay, so it's not a guarantee in the stock you're going to get a dividend back, right? And then share prices. Uh, share prices are a not necessarily a return on investment. It's more of the value of that share being increased due to level of productivity, level of growth, level of pro production. So share prices are not a direct relationship between the choices of... Yeah, it's also because people are placing different levels of value on that share itself instead of the 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 people who own like the company who are like uh, having investors and it's not a necessarily a product of their choice it's more a product of different sets of choices that different people make so like and it's also different levels of value people place on that share itself so it's not a guarantee i'm very confused why it's share prices in there it doesn't make any sense to me and yeah i'm pretty sure companies do not guarantee to companies Division profits based on the number of shares owned by a shareholder and gains dividend. Wait, what rights do all common shareholders have? Most important rights that all common shareholders possess include the right to share in a company's profitability, income, and assets, a degree of control and influence over the company management selection, preemptive rights to newly issued shares, and general meeting voting rights, right to share in profitability. As partial owners of the company, common shareholders have the right to participate in confidence profitability for as long as they own the shares the division of profits is based on the number of shares owned by a shareholder and gains can be substantial to shareholders over time in addition to a share in profits generated by the, by the company 
Shareholders also have the rights to income distribution through dividend payments. Dividends are not guaranteed, however, if company is liquidated, common shareholders have the right to assets and income of the company after bondholders and preferred shareholders are paid. Okay. So, dividends are not guaranteed by a company, therefore it's not... So, if a dividend is being paid out, they they have a right to it. But if it's not being paid out, then they don't have a right to have a dividend. Now, the question I have is, division of profits based... So, if dividends are not guaranteed, and then from there, the common shareholders have the right to participate in the company's profitability for as long as they own the share division of profits. So, profits themselves can be roughly equated to dividends in this instance because there's a there's how much you've invested and how much you take back in terms of profits or uh, the value of whatever is made and such. So, why would a company invest in a worker co-op? Well, it's because on the most, you, I would say, and a significant portion of why com people invest or companies invest in different companies is because the value, right? They expect this value to go up and to increase in price to be able to therefore eventually sell that share. So that's a significant component of why companies would invest in a, a worker co-op that there if they are being profitable if they are going to bring a high price and this is worth the level of risk then they would invest in that co-op and once the co-op is uh, generating a high enough value rate then from there they're like okay gauging my willingness to sell this share then they're like okay the share is re uh the share has come to a certain level of threshold that I am comfortable selling this, and therefore they're going to make a profit. The profit's not going to be immediate, because they're not going to necessarily get dividends and all that stuff, right? But they they can uh, increase the share, have the share price increase. They can uh, dictate to some some extent uh, policy and management and choices the company makes in terms of different resources and all that stuff that they're going to decide upon. So therefore. It comes to the share price and increase or decrease share prices itself as opposed to the direct dividend payments. So that's so the issue he's saying, why would they invest in a company is that that's basically is. And the problem comes with Witcher Wolf sometimes is that he's not necessarily going to accurately argue his positions because he's engaging in a lot of uh, broad term speaking as an academic debate lecturer, right? As opposed to... Uh, Destiny, who's been trying to narrow and nail him down significantly, and that first portion of the debate was basically him trying to say what's socialism and what is not socialism. And I would, I wouldn't say you would have to watch this the whole entire debate because it feels a little mind numbing, right? Witcher Wolf, I think, if we're using modern terms, is a Marxist Leninist significantly because he, uh, because his uh, definitions of socialism and how they're implemented and all that stuff is significantly problematic. And Destiny is a debate bro who's a liberal, even though his method of attack, while maybe effective, is also going to be a problem in itself. Because there are significant demonstrations through this uh, debate review, it's, or this debate itself, that shows that Richard Wolf is not necessarily like backing down <laughs> and it's kind of funny to watch that are bad in capital markets where companies uh, scam people much as i can show you bad things that happen like famines under the ussr but pointing out to a few bad actors does not clear up the problem of the fact that investing in well, a co-op where the about, workers have no obligation about, to return no, anything no, to an investor about bad actors you're inventing these things we were talking about private investment and worker co-ops. You had made a statement that these somehow couldn't coexist. I'm explaining to you that there's not the slightest problem. You want to change the topic, that's very nice. But that's what the topic was. We weren't comparing goods and bad stories. We were explaining how and why private investment is not an either or in relationship to worker co-ops. One of the fastest growing industries <laughs> in Spain is something called the Mondragon Cooperative Corporation. Mm -hmm. It's a so he mentioned this and I've 
and I plan on researching this, so eventually we'll probably do a, a research stream on the Mondragon uh, worker co-op, uh, the how it was formed, how it existed, and the way it re reflects reality today. That'd be interesting. The family of worker co-ops. They're not even worker managed, though. I, I don't know. This isn't even a good. It is. It is. It is the seventh largest corporation in Spain. It's a federation it of corporations. Excuse me. It's a federation it's of corporations, federation and corporations. it's not even worker managed. That's it's just worker owned, called, and they have all the same exploitative problems. They go to South America for labor. They rely on contract labor. Chomsky has criticized the Mondragon thing for existing in a capitalist framework forever. And even if this was your go-to killer example, the Mondragon Federation of Co-ops exists under a capitalist framework. What does your video sound like? Go to artlist.io and get the best music and sound effects for your video. So I just, I do want to push back on one little thing. He's saying that if it, they've existed in a capitalist framework, right? Well, the problem comes is every single nation. The problem comes is on a global scale that capitalism itself exists. What happens is the worker co-ops is not an example of socialism and includes the examples of how socialist policies therefore can have significant it's a, it's a comparison right we have uh, traditional owned c uh, corporations and we have worker co uh, co-ops so what happens is we make a comparison between the two different types of bodies and see how effective they are compared to each other therefore we have to ask is this policy more effective and therefore therefore a more reliable system and then from there is you can't view the worker co-op in isolation what you have to do is view each implementation of the socialist policy in totality what you can do is in a capitalist framework you can isolate socialist policies and figure out a way to make capitalism either more effective or uh, alleviate the conditions of the working class to a certain extent however Without the implementation of a socialist policy in totality, therefore, they are not going to effectively have a socialist policy or a socialist nation or a socialist government or a socialist world. And so, therefore, that's the problem it comes as a whole. Could I finish or do you need to tell me about the Mondragon Corporation? I'm, I didn't mean to interrupt your lecture. I'm sorry. Continue. Sure you did. Come on. Who do you think? It <laughs> See, that was one of the things uh, that I was laughing because what hap what happens is um, Richard Wolf just kind of like, are you done? And he just kind of pulls like the old man, even though like he is a boomer. The fact that he did that was pretty funny. And you can see that it was pretty rhetorically effective. So that's like one instance of like Richard Wolf's rhetoric that is pretty effective. The Mondragon Corporation has many parts. The biggest single part of it are a collection of worker co-ops. Okay. If this were the United States, we'd call it a holding company, which is a collection of subsidiaries that do a variety of things. It's very common in the United States, and it's very common in the world of worker co-ops to do that as well. The different di divisions help each other. The co-ops support one another. That's how the Mondragon Corporation went from six people in 1956 to over 100,000 now. Most of the people in the Mondragon Corporation function within their members, about 200 companies, each of which has workers, one person, one vote, making democratic decisions. This company has been extraordinarily successful. It has outcompeted its capitalist uh, competitors. That's how it became so large. That's how it becomes so successful as it has. Yeah, but the problem comes, it doesn't make it any less capitalist it just increases the level of democratic representation so it may more it may include more socialist policies and it may include more democratic participation but it doesn't take away from that it's existing within the capitalist framework as destiny points out so however is if you include these include these uh existences of worker co-ops and federation of co-ops and then you also include uh the but also it's like to the, what extent do the workers uh, manage their own affairs what extent do they make the decisions of invest uh, decisions of production all that stuff right how much how much involvement does the workers itself 
act in the centralized company. And that's a, that could be a problem in itself. Has been. It has rules. It maximizes, because you raised that before, a variety of objectives. It is not focused exclusively on profits. The notion that profit is the bottom line is the very convenient economic nonsense because profits go into the hands of the capitalists at the top. And of course they want the company to maximize profits because that's what they get. They don't maximize wages because that's what they don't get. Other people get that. If the other people ran the business, its objectives would not just be profit, but the well-being of those workers, the community's well-being, a whole lot of other objectives to maximize and you'd have to choose among them. You wouldn't have the essential profit maximizing, which we teach in economics without explaining to our students that by maximizing profit, the whole company's life is devoted to maximizing the return of a very small number of people within it. Yeah, I mean, I agree with them. I just, it's, a, it's just a very aggressive thing, and I just don't really have anything to say here. If, although, I would need to do, um, I would need to look at Mondragon specifically and see if his arguments themselves reflect the actual reality of Mondragon as a whole. So, we would have to investigate uh, uh, the overall, just general, like, how it's organized which po which where the policies come from how the policy is dictated how the op policy is uh first introduced we'd also have to see if the collection of profits and where the majority of profits are distributed and we would also have to see how the democratic participation system itself works so there's a lot of different things that exist here and we would have i also am very curious where Mo the mondragon union itself is the mondragon Worker co-op in Spain. Okay. Cool. Spain has a long um, history of revolution and it a long history of Spain uh, revolution, communism, socialism, and what happens is a. Uh, for a while, they had a revolution implemented an anarchist policy, but. Due to a lot of pressures, uh, anarchists, the anarchists, uh, were basically kicked out and like r eradicated there almost. So, you know, a lot of uh, pressures outside. While it was not a perfect represent, it was not perfect in itself. It did have uh, significant improvements and significant uh, examples we can point to to indicate the level of. A anarchist policies that are effective and ways to reform and revise it from there. Okay, this is what has changed in a worker co-op. That's why it's so different from capitalism. It's decisions, investment, growth, distribution of income. All the big decisions would be made with a different set of objectives because a different set of people with different interests are making those decisions. For a society like ours, that blabbers on about democracy, you'd think this was the most attractive possible way to proceed because it democratizes the economy by democratizing the enterprises at the core of that uh, economy. Instead, we live in a society which pretends that you can have political democracy even though in economics you have an autocracy a tiny aristocracy running each enterprise, doing what it wants. So there's a little bit of a what about them saying it's like, okay, uh, oh god, I hate that. Max, there you go, that's better. His face was just like fuel, pure rage right there. Okay, so that what happens is he's saying, yes. This is how the things itself works, and there can be significant issues and barriers and all that stuff that come into it. But what about uh, all these traditional corporations? It's better than those. Just because it's better than those doesn't mean it's necessarily good. So in this instance, is 
you can make a comparison of which is better and which is a more preferable system in a capitalist framework. However, you have to ask the question, is it significantly socialist? And you have to ask, is it being implemented with other series of policies alongside it instead of just being viewed in isolation? And so that's the problem is liberal policies view, I think, in a way we can make a distinction between liberal and socialist policies is the level of totality. Liberal policies are more individual uh, implementations that are effective in that it, it individual sphere. However, it does not account for all the other aspects that deal with it, and therefore it is not included in totality, and therefore it's not significantly socialist. So that's a significant barrier and a problem that comes in itself with these kind of uh, relationships, is that liberal policies individually may have some level of improvement, but they are not being included in totality. And so that's the issue between socialism and liberal policies, is that liberal policies often incorporate socialist policies in individual components, but not as a whole framework, because otherwise we would have not capitalism, but socialism. Maximizing the part of the output it gets, namely the profit, and therefore we get surprised that our political democracy doesn't work real well. Hello, that's because it's trying to sit on top of an economic system that is the opposite of democratic. The proposal of socialists is a proposal to extend democracy from the political realm to the economic realm. Why that is frightening to people who otherwise say they favor democracy, I find amazing. I find it equally amazing that throughout this entire monologue, you, all you're advocating for are liberal markets with a little bit more government intervention. If you want to talk about all. Mondrag, absolutely. If you want to talk about Mondrag... I mean, a worker co-op has not government intervened. It's workers uh, creating a co-op from there, so... It's not more government intervention. Now, if you want to talk about government intervention in terms of implementing the policy itself, then you would have to... Sorry, my brain. So if you want to talk about government intervention, you have to ask is how, what extent are we going to have government intervene and allow the propagation and survival of these worker co-ops? So that's a significant component in itself from there. So that's something you would have to ask. So... Uh, I don't want to go over the rest of this because it's just another hour of life and we've already spent so much time here. So, what did we learn? Here, let me change it. What did we learn? Um, Richard Wolf. Some good points. Seems kind of cringy on Marxist Leninist policies by calling the USSR and China socialist. Destiny. Well... He has some dog shit opinions. His rhetoric is a little more on point, even if he's being like, uh, as even if he's in a way um, saying it's just this. His his characterization is pretty ineffective, but his means of trying to narrow down and come to an effective point to talk about is pretty effective. That's why we got to worker co-ops. So as a whole. There's not really a winner in this debate as much, even though uh, I would say Richard Wolf has his good moments, Destiny has his good moments as well. There's not really a winner. There's not a clear victor, because they both kind of sucked, I think. But as a whole, there's some things to learn from both of them. And as a whole, I think that's something interesting. So other than that, make sure you like, share, subscribe, leave a comment. Thank you very much.